Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. So, the story I'm going to tell you about today started about a century ago, in the 1920s. Uh, it was a long discussion between these two gentlemen, Einstein and Bohr, on the foundations of quantum mechanics, the role of physical theories in explaining the world of experiments, of philosophy, and what uh, and how we understand uh, what surrounds us. Uh, the main question was how to make sense of the strange world of quantum phenomena. At that time it was a mystery because nobody understood with a classical intuition how that is possible and what we observe can make any sense with uh, what we know from everyday experience. Um, Einstein was on the side of classical physics. He believed in causality, predictability, uh, a very nice and orderly world in which you know exactly what you'll get if you have the right equations. Bohr, on the other side, was on the side of the new physics. Uh, the quantum physics, which is unpredictable, it's random. We don't know what we will get in the experiments, but we know how to predict statistically. Uh, for Bohr, that was the normal world. For Einstein, he couldn't agree with that. And he kept saying, God does not play dice. So nature, at its ultimate, at fundament, is not random, cannot be random, according to his conception. On the other hand, Bohr replied, Einstein, stop telling God what to do with his dice. Uh, meaning that we should not have preconception of how nature acts. And we should forget sometimes how intuition at the classical scale works and we should believe in the experiments and try to build our theories according to the experiments. Um, there is a very deep unsettling feeling about quantum mechanics and everybody who came into contact with quantum mechanics uh, had the same question mark. We don't know how things are. Bohr said that anyone who is not shocked by quantum mechanics has not understood it. And many years later, Feynman uh, said that I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And I have to mention both of them get the Nobel Prize for physics for exactly studies in quantum mechanics. So how do we stand today? Do we understand finally quantum mechanics? Well, the story is complicated. We know how to predict. It's one of the most successful theories which we have. We know how to calculate, how to predict, and our whole technology is based on quantum mechanics. Think of transistors, think of lasers, think of GPS and atomic clocks. So there is a gap between what we can predict and calculate and what we understand. And it's interesting that we don't have to understand how certain things work in order to use them. And probably everybody knows the computer. We don't know what's inside the computer and how it works, but we know how to use it. And it's a bit the same with quantum mechanics. It's a fantastic tool, but we don't know what's inside the black box. We don't know how nature does it, because it clashes so fundamentally with our intuition. So let's start it simple with uh, the classical world. The classical world is very simple. There's no mystery here. Particles are particles, waves are waves. We have a, an intuitive grasp of what is one and what is the other. They are separate, they don't intersect. A wave, it's something continuous. Um, it's extended in space and it shows interference. We know, for example, from a TV antenna what interference is. On the other hand, particles are discrete. They come in chunks. They're localized. And they don't interfere. So far, so good. So these are very simple and intuitive ideas. But what do experiments show us in the quantum world? So after thousands of experiments, what we know is that a quantum system will behave according to the question we ask it. So sometimes 
setting up an experiment, it will behave in a wave-like manner. So it will show interference, it will show delocalization. Other times, the same quantum system will show a particle-like behavior, localized, no interference. So imagine you have a box, this box is your experiment and you have a switch. If the switch is up, you set up one experiment and your quantum systems can be electrons, photons, atoms, molecules, they will show interference, wave-like aspect. If the switch is down, they don't interfere, they will show particle-like behavior. Now, this is very strange. How come the same objects show two different behaviors which are so different from what we expect? So in the quantum world, the main conclusion is that particles are waves, and waves are particles sometimes. So how that can be possible? How come something which is localized like a particle can be in two places at once? Nobody knows. We know that this is how it happens, but we don't know how, again, nature does it. We don't know what is inside the black box. So this is a very deep mystery. And it's no wonder that the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, Bohr, Schrodinger, and others, turned to oriental philosophy and to mysticism in their philosophical writings. So, for example, Bohr's coat of arms had the yin-yang symbol and the words contraria sunt complementa. The opposite are complementary. Again, a concept from uh, Oriental philosophy. So, in a sense, this is what attracted me uh, to quantum mechanics. Uh, because it kind of offers a glimpse of nature mystery. We don't know how it works. It's, it's continuously challenging us. And for me, I find very much the wave-particle duality, which I was talking before, looks very much like a Zen koan. So a koan, it's a short Zen story, which apparently is paradoxical. You cannot understand it with classical logic. One of the most known examples of a koan is this one. Two hands clap, and there is a sound. What is the sound of one hand? The role of the koan is to help the disciple to attain enlightenment by suspending everyday intuition and breaking through the barriers of normal logic. So, how would you understand the wave-particle duality? One way of thinking about that is that, okay, maybe the photon knows beforehand what we're going to ask. So, he sees the experiment, and uh -huh, they're going to ask me a particle-like question. I'll behave like a particle. Next experiment, they will ask me a wave-like question. I'll behave like a, like a wave. Um, in order to test this, Wheeler proposed many years ago uh, the so-called delay choice experiment. And he said, okay, let's make the choice when the photon is already inside the box. So, we set up our experiments without making the choice, we let the quantum system, the photon, for example, coming inside, and only after that, making the choice. This experiment has been performed, and again, quantum mechanics has been confirmed. Our intuition completely fails. Again, we don't understand. So, about three years ago, together with Danny Turner from Macquarie University, we start thinking how to push this absurd situation even further. So we decided to cut the Gordian knot. And we said, OK, forget about waves. Forget about particles. Think instead on information. Focus on information, on how it flows between subsystems, and how to control it. So what we did was to ask a simple question. What happens if the choice itself becomes quantum? So before, we had a switch, which was up or down, determining what experiment you do. What we did was to turn that switch into a quantum system, which can be in a superposition. It can be, for example, both closed and open. So what happens in that case? Now, a couple of interesting things start to emerge. So first, what we can do 
is to first detect the photon and then make the choice. Now, this is totally absurd. How can you ask a question after the photon is already dead? So the photon is detected, is dead. How can you make the choice of what question, of what experiment to do uh, after? Of course, this is absurd, and we all know that in quantum land, absurd is the norm. So the experiment has been done by several groups last year, and they all confirmed our predictions. So what happens is that you pass from a black or white uh, image in which you have either particles or waves, you pass through a kind of infinite numbers of shades of, of gray. So you can have uh, a photon which is half particle and half wave simultaneously, or three quarters particle and one quarter wave. So basically the photon shows a morphing behavior between one side when you have full interference behaves like a wave to the other side in which it shows no interference so it behaves like a particle so this is the morphing behavior which has been observed so the message here is that it's all about information and how we interpret that information the meaning of that and what it means to us and of course the photon is neither a wave nor uh, a particle it's something different I'd like to end with another quote from Bohr, which is very beautiful. Um, he said that when it comes to atoms, language can be used only as in poetry. The poet, too, is not nearly so concerned with describing facts as with creating images and establishing mental connections. So the metaphor I think is appropriate and I would like to end with is Plato's cave. In a certain sense, what we observe are just shadows on uh, the cave's wall. Think of a cylinder, cylinder which can be, which shadows has either, it's either a wave, sorry, either a, a square or, um, uh, or a circle. Of course, a cylinder, it's neither a circle nor uh, a square. It's something completely different. It's a three-dimensional object. So... Turning back to the uh, koan, the solution of the uh, one hand clapping koan is to realize that the koan and the self which thinks about the koan are one identity. And when one realizes this identity, the two hands become one. And that is the sound of one hand. In the quantum world, we have to realize that wave and particle are just two sides of the same coin. The photon is neither a wave nor a particle. It's a quantum object, something which transcends both. It's completely different. Sometimes it appears to be a wave. Some other times it appears to be a particle. So we have to realize that we need new concepts and that the classical concepts are no longer enough. We have to enlarge our vocabulary to include this strange world of quantum phenomena. So... In a certain sense, behavior is in the eye of the observer. Thank you.